Well, hi, everybody. I'm here, delightedly, I'm th- thrillingly, <laughs> with Lainey Brown. Hi, Lainey. How are you? I'm happy to be here. It's always good to see you. And thank you for choosing this poem that we're about to talk about. And Joe Park. Hello. Hi, how are you? Great. You are my colleague here at the University of Pennsylvania. And I love coming up with excuses like this, so you can come down here to the writer's mm-hmm. house. Thank you. And here from, just in from Wisconsin, Tim Yu, Timothy Yu, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Al. Thanks for coming. And I understand that this is, you haven't done a lot of gigs outside of Zoom. I have not. I have not. So this, this is, is one maybe, of my first. maybe number one or nearly it, number one. It might be number one. Great. You haven't missed us, lost a step. <laughs> Let's say that. Okay, so we are going to talk about a poem by Hoa Nguyen, and it is called Dang You Then a Dang. And would you, Joe, hold up a copy of the book and tell us a little bit about it, the title and the year of publication and the publisher? So this is um, a thousand... Maybe turn it toward the camera. Oh, sorry. (laughs) A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure by Hua Wen. And this is published Wave Books 2021. And this, this book of poetry has the best photographs you'll ever see in your life. Wow, so I highly a, recommend. That's a teaser. <laughs> I, that's incredible. Great. I'm sure we'll talk about it. And this poem is also available in an earlier version at the Poetry Foundation website. And we, f- to go along with this video, will reproduce the a copy from the book. And now I'm going to ask, since it's a relatively short poem, ask Tim and Lainey both to recite it. And then we'll talk about it. Dang you then a dang. Trip me up a startled, robbed way. Dreamt a burnt stump for a tongue. Ash her ash haired girl. Cowbell girl. The white American veteran said, Children like you played in the garbage. Leftovers. She said, I left my ease here. Heavy trays trick me. The trick of the model minority. A favored shitty condition. We rung up the diction tones to be proud. We were. I threw you away. And old skins shed as a silver snake. 1941, sweet toddler on the crook of her hip. Dang you then a dang. Trip me up a startled, robbed way. Dreamt a burnt stump for a tongue. Ash-haired girl, cowbell girl, the white American veteran said, Children, like you played in the garbage, leftovers. She said, I left my ease here. Heavy trays, trick knee, the trick of the model, minority, a favored shitty condition. We rung up diction tones to be proud we were. I threw you away, and old skins shed as a silver snake. 1941, sweet toddler on the crook of her hip. Thank you both. Tim, um, as admirers of poetry and as teachers of poetry and critics of poetry, the last thing we ever want to do is simply say what a poem is about. But this poem is so about, so strongly about things, that you have to ask a question first, how is the way that the poem is written and organized, lineated, phrasally constructed, how does that form of the poem, the way the poem is on the page, relate it to its many topics? In other words, how the poem is made is sort of part of what the poem is about. 
It's a classic question, but it's not so easy to answer in the context of any one poem. No, it's always kind of the most important question uh, as a teacher of poetry, and it's also the hardest to answer, you know, what's the relationship between form and content? And you're right, this poem is really striking in that regard, because there are these really striking moments of aboutness, I guess. And, you know, the, the two that kind of jump out are, of course, the, the kind of words spoken by the white American veteran, children like you played in the garbage. And, you know, obviously that kind of reflects on, you know, that evokes kind of the U.S. war in Vietnam and the idea of, um, you know, kind of uh, children or orphans, especially kind of children, uh, you know, sometimes children of American servicemen um, who are, uh, you know, sort of seen as these children who've been kind of abandoned or discarded. And that's one kind of context that's that's here. The other one that jumps out to me, of course, is the, the trick of the model minority. And so the model minority being kind of, you know, a, a standard trope about Asian Americans. And I think, you know, I don't know that I've ever seen a pithier description of the model minority, a favored shitty condition, which is that, like, to be a model minority is like, oh, you know, Asians are so accomplished, Asians are so smart, it's, but it's, and yet it's still a way of kind of marginalizing or dehumanizing, you know, as... Um, you know, Frank Chin's famous uh, phrasing of it is that it's racist love rather than racist hate. And so, um, you know, and so those are the moments that kind of magnetically draw you in terms of the content. But then what's so interesting is that those moments kind of quickly like veer off, you know, you, you played in the garbage leftovers. She said, I left my ease here. Now, who's she? Like, you know, what's being said? What context is this being spoken in? So I think one really interesting thing the poem does is that it gives us these moments where we feel like we grasp the kind of aboutness. And then it, it really sort of fragments and sort of veers off from those moments into other places. And it starts off, you know, a burnt stump for a tongue, which, again, could be a very kind of viscerally real image or could be very metaphorical. So I, I think that's kind of one thing that these, this, mm. these sort of fragmented lines do. So that's such a great start on this. Um, Laney and Joe, a form of the same question. Uh, Tim just said, well, you know, you, you get content, gripping content, and then the poem veers off deliberately. It doesn't go further for you. It, I'm not going to answer the question for you because I want to... I really want to hear what you have to say. This poem does that. All poems, all poems we admire, I, th I would stipulate, do that. They give you content that is powerful, and then they veer, because poems veer. They have to veer. So can you say a little more, and it may just be a close reading of a moment of veering. Why does this poet do that? Just when we got the model minority point, we rung up the diction notes. What? You know, so... Tell us about some veering there. Who wants to go? I think um, Lainey I wants can to go. go first. So that particular veering, we rung up the diction tones, makes me think about how song is really important in Hua's work. And so there is a song, there is a story, there is a story of, of the poet's mother. And it's also not only the that story. And so there's a desire to tell the story, but there's a refusal to tell the story. And so there's this haunted space in wow. the in the blank space and the way that she's using the page and she's she's borrowing from songs and and folk tales and ghost stories. And she's there's also the story of her mother. So when I hear we rung up diction tones, I, I thought, okay, that could be making calls, like t calling, right? A way of saying ring up. We don't right? do that much. Lingual. There's a lingual play, like right. what is the rung diction? Rung up is also a ch checking off an accomplishment. Right. There's potentially kind of code switching, like talking for different audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and something that's really particular in Hua's work is... Um, not just switching tones, but switching frequencies. So she's moving in between the real, the concrete, the histories, and then the frequencies, the ancestors, the memories, the legend, the, you know, something that is beyond the physical and the concrete that's in the memory, like the living memory, the ancestral mm -hmm. memory, and the day to day. And I, that's so the veering to the form, I think. So the veering in that moment takes us from something we think we've grappled with, favorite shitty condition, 
and turns to diction tones, and we are left to figure out the relationship between the problem of the model minority and the favorite shitty condition, the racist love, in quotes, and its relation to the diction tones. Can you go there? Well, I mean, it's also, it's also singing, you know, so song is a way to untell the story, to tell the story, to not tell the story. Um, mm-hmm. It's a way to veer. In other words, when you can't say it in language, you can say it in song, or mm-hmm. it can reside in a collective mm-hmm. tale. Which is itself a kind of code switching when you're talking about language mm-hmm. and the music of poetry. It's multilingual in that way. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, also good. like the ghost of uh, you know, other languages. languages. Okay. Yeah. So you did a if I may, a really fabulous job of helping readers and viewers deal with a moment of what we're calling veering by telling us how we get there and also saying you have to go there. You can't Mm -hmm. stick, you can't use your highlighter and mark model minority, I know what that is, and maybe look it up and write about it in your paper on this poem (laughs) and not not figure out what the, the diction tones are. Mm-hmm. So, Joe, do you have another? Can we do another veering? Sure. I mean, I think the there's so there's so many miracles in this poem. I think, um, but I so I I'm a I'm obsessed with the aboutness of poem, and and I can be very prosaic. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I will say, you know, I, I became obsessed with Hua's portrait of her mother, you know, in the haunting here, and I love the so. The trick knee, the trick of the model minority, I love that rhyme. But, you know, one thing that we learned in the poem with this amazing is that her mother was a trick yeah, motorcycle motorist um, in Vietnam, which is totally unbelievable at the age of 15. And so and we, in a different poem, we learned that her mother damaged her knee. So, you know, the trick knee from a motorcycle kickstand, motorbike pick, kickstand, and she was a waitress, so it's a, I'm sorry to add the aboutness, but, you know, the... That that trick knee and the trick of the model minority. I mean, the model minority does not perform in motorcycle circuses. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm fascinated, you know, by the the kind of the trick that this incredible mother is able to perform, and the tricks that are performed by us. You know, when we come uh, from these other places, and then I'm sorry to be more about this mother who I became obsessed with. You know that that silver snake. I I, I know this because my dad. 1941 is the year my dad was born, and that's the year, the year of, snake. of the snake. And so, that's and her mother, you know, the, shedding uh, the metal snake, which yeah. is somewhat silvery, yeah. right? And but you know that um, the you know obviously here the skin the skins that snake shed. And this is what the minority does. We shed our skins. We play tricks, you know. And so this favored shitty condition, it's it's actually a kind of miracle transformation all the time. You know, that's kind of like the wonder of her mother. Joe, you do that's yourself amazing. a disservice by calling <laughs> that just aboutness. Because what you've done is you're helping us here spontaneously. We did not prepare this. I mean, we prepared, but we didn't plan. Um, <laughs> we're, we're now doing a reading of, because uh, Tim put in the, played in the garbage leftovers. So we're going from child, the veteran's statement to the trick knee, which is the most amazing poetic phrase. It's doing so much work. To the model minority stuff, to the diction tones. And down to the silver snake. And we're doing a close reading by following the veering. Mm -hmm. So I guess, Tim, do you want to add to the above or below that? Well, you know, I mean, that that context is is absolutely fascinating. And it's interesting because, I mean, I first encountered this poem when it was published in Poetry Magazine. Actually, was in uh, an issue that I was a special editor for. And so you so chose it? I, I did choose it. And, you know, and so I, you know, when I saw this poem immediately, you know, when Hua sent us this poem, I was like, wow, this poem is incredible. I love this poem. But of course, I didn't have the poem in the context that it's in the book. So I read it in a much more kind of abstract way. Now, having the context around like the trick knee, right? I mean, it just, it opens up into all of these different narrative trajectories. But I guess what's interesting is that the poem itself doesn't give us a narrative, right? What it gives us is these pointers to kind of different contexts. Um, you know, the the mother, the story of the mother. I love the story about the you know the mother being a you know a, a, a like a you know a motorcycle performer and all of that. But you know, 
I, I don't know, the, the burnt stumps, um, you know, makes me think of, um, you know, is, isn't there, there a line in, in um, Elliot's The Wasteland about like the stumps of time mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. like that? And I mean, like, that's kind of, these burnt stumps are maybe like these fragments of other stories that we're getting that kind of point in different directions. With the whole book, we have those stories. But, you know, how are those fragments kind of fit together in this poem to create an evocation of the mother, of the speaker's own experience, while not kind of fully narrating something that's, that's really coherent? And sort of right. like, what's the, what's the tension there? Laney, not fully narrating, which is really the sub-theme of this conversation so far. You know, pointing at things, moving. And also, you know, there's, it's a very literary, and I don't mean that in a negative way. <laughs> and here we are in 2022, literary. A literary poem, a poem that probably has somewhere back there the post-war, post-World War I, post-war wasteland, you know, thinking about the wasteland. Um, there's Dickinson in here, mm-hmm. you know, surely. Mm-hmm. You know, it sort of sits aside some Ray Armantrout, probably. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know the actual influence. I, Gerard Manley Hopkins is in here. There's just this remarkable um, poeticness going on here, and then it's being put to the u- service of this powerful personal story. It does what poems. Should do, Lainey. I bought you a little time there. Do you want to? <laughs> well, wanna I was just thinking about how, about at this? the same time, if you take the poem out of the context of the book, it's very different than reading it in the context. Mm-hmm. There's, I feel like there still is a very vivid picture, even though there's so much that we could widely interpret. Like, for instance, I'm envisioning that that the mother is being addressed, and the toddler is the poet. Mm-hmm in the scene of the Wait, poem. Wait, you mean the poem is addressing the mother? Yeah. No, the... Except she said doesn't No, the, the white American veteran is addressing the mother. The mother and not the child. Right. And... Oh, gosh. And that the child... And maybe addressing the mother, who's very young, as a child, children like you. She's a woman with a child, but being addressed as a you. Well, so who this, said I threw you away? I mean, the poet's father, an American GI, I think a GI, uh, then abandoned the family before, before birth. I was just in, in Vietnam near Saigon in 1967. So I threw you away. Who are we supposed to think is saying that? Is that the white GI? Um, let's see. And veteran implies post-war, actually, doesn't it? Right. I, I'm I, I'm sorry. I'm assuming I threw you away. Harkens back to the garbage. And there's, I mean, but it seems, it seems like there's this, I mean, this is a horrible moment of the mother being insulted, holding the toddler on their hip, is what I'm saying. Who becomes the poet speaker. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so while there's so much we can interpret widely, that's also a very clear image, Mm -hmm. is all I'm saying. So that those things are happening at the same time. Yeah. I almost want to say it's a kind of radically condensed documentary poetics. Mm-hmm. Is that too much, Tim? What, no, what I, th- I, think that's, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think y- one can do documentary po- poetics in so many different ways, right? I think that one thing that's been really fascinating about a lot of recent poetry is that we're seeing that kind of documentary impulse expressed in so many different kind of modes and styles. I mean, sure, there's the very traditional, it's like I take kind of historical documents and sort of incorporate them in some readable, visible way. But there's also like, you know, using um, those historical moments or events with kind of personal history and using them in a fragmented, you know, poetic way that makes them almost unrecognizable, but kind of just recognizable. And I think that it's, you know, as Laney's saying, we absolutely can, you know, construct a very coherent picture of kind of an event or an experience that the poem is evoking, but it's evoking them. And I think you're right that it draws from kind of modernist technique to evoke that that emotion in you know through this kind of series of linguistic fragments mm. does anybody want to deal with dang well yeah yeah i mean maybe don't deal with it first <laughs> say what you were going to say well ah i, I was 
going to say something else. Okay. I can, no, I can tell. <laughs> I know you well okay. enough. I can tell you had something else hmm, to say. Okay. But let's get back to Dang later. Okay, okay. well, but you know, um, I was thinking about both the documentary, the event, but the kind of the literary quality. And when you when you said Dickinson, because that's what I heard, you know, yeah. in the opening, a, a startled, robbed way. I always, you know, a threadless way, you know, that Dickinson. I don't. It's hard, but although the the, the compound adjective ash haired mm-hmm. is not Dickinson, no. it's more Hopkins or I agree. Help, help no, ash haired. It really, I don't know who, but it's yeah, it's not I Dickinson. agree. Yeah. But you know, I it's well. Yeah. Or, or maybe it's Homer, actually. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, th- I think the first two couplets are, they're, they're, um, they scan would almost you, perfectly. Would you read them aloud? So, um, trip me up, a startled, robbed way, dreamt a burnt stump for a tongue. So if I do kind of a basic scansion, it's a mirror image. So trip me up and for a tongue scan identically, right? And then you have a startled, robbed way and uh, dreamt a burnt stump, but I'm going to do like a undergrad reading here, but, you know, dreamt of it, you're missing the unstressed eye. You know, I dreamt a burnt stump, you know, right. so I'm I interested. dreamt a burnt stump is it would follow and traditional. Right. And that would follow a startled, robbed way because we have the unstressed A. Do you see? You know, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, plus, you know, plus, I dreamt a burnt stump yeah. is almost like a confessional sophomoric poem. It is, right? yeah. The, the I needed to be taken out of there. Exactly. Like the removal of that eye, so it scans almost perfectly. It's very poetic, but I think the removal of that eye is doing an incredible amount of work. And then ash-haired girl, cowbell girl is the eye. I mean, elsewhere in the book, it describes the mixed race child as ash-haired. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to have that, the poetic lyric eye or whatever removed and returned as the object here as the ash-haired girl. And then we have this play, you know, the mother's kind of transformation and what happens to this kind of child, this leftover, mm-hmm. you know. And But then back to Dang, you know, I was thinking... Um, oh, you're going to do Dang? Well, I, I, I don't know. Bonus. Yeah, well, I was thinking, you know, Dang is a Vietnamese name. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so I assume that that, you know, that this is a veteran saying, Dang, you then a Dang, you know, like your name is Dang, you know, so I oh, hear... Oh, so it's a veteran making a wise-ass pun about a Vietnamese name, that mm-hmm. that's what I heard, because I immediately mm. thought, oh, well, that's a name. Mm. Wow. Okay, Tim, you've written a book, Diasporic Poetics, and it, what it, one of the things it does is, is it looks at Asian Canadian, I don't, I guess, yeah, Asian Canadian, Asian Australian, and thinking about the belatedness of Asian, uh, Asian American, Asian Canadian, et cetera, um, studies and poetry without giving us the full thesis of the book here (laughs) i would love to hear your thoughts on how this poem helps you think about this this thing you've written about and it is there's a lot of diaspora here obviously there there is although you know it's interesting the thing that first occurs to me is that um where I kind of start with the argument in a lot of ways is with the Vietnam War era and the fact that the idea of a kind of diasporic Asian identity or sort of a transnational Asian solidarity comes out of you, you have Asian American activists in this era who are expressing solidarity with the Vietnamese. You know, not with, you know, the the white American soldiers who are over there, you know, like, you know, fighting, but more with saying, hey, like, you know, the Vietnamese are sort of, you know, fighting against colonialism the same way that Asian Americans are kind of fighting against racism and white supremacy. And so, you know, I, I think that where that leads me is the idea that this poem as, you know, a poem by, you know, I mean, I don't know if Hua thinks of herself as an Asian Canadian writer at this point, but... Um, you know, moving from, you know, someone whose, you know, kind of life experience comes out of that, you know, experience of American imperialism and then writing as an Asian American writer, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a poem about experience, but it always kind of registers that history of kind of American militarism and, and imperialism. You know, the figure of the white veteran kind of can't be, you know, he has to be there, right? I mean, he's still kind of somehow 
underneath all of the, the lyric beauty of the poem, and that kind of um, historical trauma is something that's always there mm. in the poem, kind of undergirding mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. even though, as Lainey's saying, it's also this kind, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's song, it's an evocation of the mother, but that, you know, that kind of presence of the American military can kind of never really be removed. Mm. So, you know, that, mm. that to me is kind of where I see the kind of excavation of that history. Mm. Gosh, that was such a great response to a question you weren't expecting. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> no, it's really great. And I, I guess I want to ask a follow-up on that, an even harder question, and then, okay. we'll, do f- <laughs> and then we'll do final thoughts about this um, I know we could spend a lot more time on it. It's really, it really yields a close reading. Um, okay, so here's the harder question. I don't know. Transnational Asianness is a major thing you've been thinking about the mm-hmm. last these last years. Yeah. Silver Snake, the year of the snake. Metal Snake, the year of the metal snake. 1941. Now, 41 in Vietnam is a problem for Asianness because, of course, it's a time of occupation by the Japanese. Uh, the French, I guess, were driven out. Did I get that right? So French, Japanese, French, American, etc. But that's more transnational Asianness, and it's in the poem. So she, has, she is saying something about yeah. that. What yeah. is she saying? It's interesting. And of course, you know, 1941 for an American audience is going to, you know, evoke, evoke Pearl, Pearl Harbor, Harbor, and it's going yeah. to evoke, you know, the beginning of World War II and the war with Japan. You know, I, okay, so I'm going to quote another poet. I mean, one, I write about this poem by Janice Mirakatani, where Mirakatani um, has these lines that are um, Hiroshima, Vietnam, Thule Lake. And so, you know, she's linking the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima to the war in Vietnam to Japanese American internment. Now, obviously, when she says Hiroshima, she's evoking, you know, kind of the, you know, the American dropping of the atomic bomb and kind of the, you know, the vast, like, um, sort of, you know, the vast scale of death, you know, among Japanese civilians that that leads to. That doesn't mean a kind of, like, endorsement of Japanese imperialism. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the, when we see a kind of solidar- a trans, you know, national Asian solidarity around something like anti-imperialism, you know, that imperialism can also be carried on by Asian powers, right? It can be carried on by, by Japan or, or China. I think there's a mode of transnational kind of Asianness that is more sort of nationalist in a narrow way. I think that, you know, the kind of diasporic Asian poetics that I look at tends to be this more kind of anti-colonial, anti-imperialist uh, impulse. And so I think that, and again, to return to this poem, I think by grounding it in, you know, kind of this, this sort of racism of the, the white American veteran, um, I think it sort of signals its solidarity with that kind of anti-imperialist impulse, as opposed to saying like, okay, well, you know, we're talking about two kind of Asian powers sort of facing off, which is another way of framing this. I think that Mm. the poem does place it more in that kind of history of of American imperialism. Thank you, Joe. I actually want in a second to ask you to add your thoughts to this uh, topic, but I just want to ask one more thing. The, you're saying, I think, that the inclusion of the easy to hate white veteran is actually not easy. It's not simply um, a unifying moment uh, for an anti-racist reading. It's actually much more complicated because it, it, it exposes the whole problem of transnational unity Right, so it's. I think you're saying that's not an easy. We could one could read this as easy, easy to hate in the middle of the poem, and now we know where we stand. But that's not it. The ideology of this poem is much more complicated. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. Thank you, Joe. Any th- added thought before we do final thoughts on this? What what Tim has been saying because you just read his book. So yeah, no, I'll just say I agree. <laughs> 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 no, I mean I think you're now. I've been thinking is, about these issues yes. yourself for a long time. Yeah, I you know I just. I don't know. I just go back to that. For, it tripped me up. You know, that's what this poem is doing. You know? Nice. Mm. <laughs> that's nice. Okay, final thoughts. Uh, Lainey, do you want to start? you have a final I thought? I do. I want to quote something that Hua wrote in an interview about this book. And she says, 
The whole reality was considered a complex system of cartography, and it took a lot of careful mapping. I was guiding by something that Jack Spicer said, words must be led across time, not preserved against it. Also, a poet is a time, a time mechanic, not an embalmer. Nice. Thank you. Glad you put that into the record. Tim, final thought? Yeah, well, I almost don't want to. I just want to leave those words <laughs> hanging. They're so good. Would you know, you, uh, respond I, to them? Yeah, well, you know, I, I mean, I think this is part of what's so wonderful about Hua's work is that, you know, it, it works in so many different registers, right? I mean, you know, th that, that quote from Spicer is this idea of, you know, um, the time mechanic is that what she said? Mm -hmm. That's 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 so great. Um, and you know, and on the one hand, you know, it's 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 a great image because it's kind of like you know, a mechanic is somebody who's kind of like tinkering with parts and sort of putting things together and seeing what what sort of fits and what works. Uh, you know, and on the other hand, it, there is this kind of very sign of kind of deep historicity to the poem that also kind of resonates, and that's the kind of time element. So you know, it's. There, there's this incredible craft, but then it's also kind of looking back through this very long kind of telescope into the the past. So I think that's that's something I really I really value about this poem. Thank you, Joe. Oh, I'll just say how lovely the last couplet is, and how it returns. I mean, sweet toddler on the crook of her hip. It, I don't, I mean, this... It's photographic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's actually a resolution here. When this is not an easy poem, but it is sweet. I, yeah. I like this ending. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's lyrical in the way it's, the poem it's begins. It's haiku-like, mm -hmm. right? So we've been talking about the various traditions that are coming into play here. And, you know, if it had just been a couple of haikus, it would play much too easily into mm -hmm. the very stereotypes it's fighting against. But I love the way that it ends with that. Mm -hmm. My final thought is about the phrase, um, I left my ease here. Um, that's devastating, I think, because that's a post facto recollection of what was lost and left behind. Um, it reads to me like survivor testimony. It's, it's said in a present tense of the testament of the bearing witness, but the here is confusing because here would be back home, presumably, at the, in the place of the trauma. So we have, a, we have a before, a during, and an after. The before is 1941, and it may be a personal before. I don't know when her mother was born. Um, so it could be, could be 41. When your mother was born. Well, I, I think it might be because, well, again, if you trace out the dates of when her mother joined the motorist, yeah. it, that does... I'm guessing. She's yeah. a year of the snake kid. Yeah. Okay. So we have a before. The before is as complicated as Tim helped us understand. The during is the dreaming of burnt stumps, which is, you know, horror, first impressions of child horror. Um, and that triggers the trip me up. The trip me up to me is a trigger of deep memory. Mm -hmm. And bur dreaming of the bur the burnt stump is the deep is the is the deep memory. So we have the during, and then we have the after, which is I left my ease here. That is the testimony that lingers years later. Mm -hmm. So there's a survivor in here, and the child of the survivor who turns into a speaker poet is giving the survivor a chance to bear witness in an extremely beautifully complicated mm -hmm. way. Tim Yu, thank you so much. This was really, really great. This was really a great conversation. Lainey Brown, thank you for curating this, My for picking pleasure. this poem so wisely. And Joe Park, thank you. Thanks so much. Always. <laughs> <laughs>